this story that we're going to read right here in the Gospel of Mark is a controversial story, especially with the rise of modern day feminism. It's a very controversial story, and it's a story that often people refer to or Bible teachers will teach, and they feel like they have to sort of go into defense mode, like self-defense mode, Bible defense mode, you know. Um, I'm not really super interested in doing that, because as soon as we do that, we're sort of anachronistically reading the Bible through the lens of defending it against modern culture instead of learning what God's trying to show us here. Um, So some are tempted maybe to water it down to make it acceptable. I, I understand that temptation, but I think that temptation is bad. Um, I think that we need to change the way we think as we approach God's word, not try to change God's word to fit the way we think. That would be a reverse of what we should do. So we're going to take it in full force. And while it's offensive to some, we're going to get a biblical worldview out of it. That's the goal here. Because one, it's not what the people who are triggered think it is. They're, they're wrong about it. They're wrong about it. And two, it's actually really important that we take it in full force so we can understand the humility with which we must come to Christ. That's the idea. So let, I'm just going to read through it here. Mark chapter 7, verse 24. This is actually part 24 of the Mark series going verse by verse through the whole gospel of Mark very slowly, <laughs> I might add, um, but we're going to do the whole book. Here we are, chapter 7, verse 24. <clears throat> I'll read through verse 37, or excuse me, through verse 30. Jesus got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre. And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know of it, yet he could not escape notice. But after hearing of him, A woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now, the woman was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered and said to him, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. And he said to her, because of this answer, go, the demon has gone out of your daughter. And going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed, the demon having left. So there's a lot of different things that we could talk about right here. But what we're going to do is, um, among other things, focus on this whole idea about, you know, Jesus, is he comparing this woman to a dog? And the answer is yes. I mean, I, I, I mean, you read what I read, right? Like, I, yes, he is. But the questions we want to ask are why, what's the lesson here? Um, and that is where our our trigger happy culture forces, I guess, bad categories onto the passage, and then we misunderstand what Jesus is actually getting at. This is about Jewish Gentile issues. It's about the promise of God and the fulfillment of Christ, and it is about uh, coming humbly to Christ. It's so you'll get there with me. It's actually pretty beautiful stuff. So first thing, verse twenty four says, Jesus got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre. Now, what we want to notice in the Gospel of Mark, we don't know because we're not from Galilee. Anybody here from Galilee? Raise your hand. Maybe somebody online is watching from Galilee, actually, so you know, but we don't. <laughs> um, Tyre, especially back then, 2,000 years ago, it is a Gentile region. It's a Gentile region. Um, Josephus actually describes the relationship between the Tyrians, from the people from Tyre, as having uh, bore the greatest ill will towards the Jews. That of, of the people, you know, how the Jews interact with people in their world, there's a special amount of animosity between them and the people from Tyre. And so he's heading up and he's going to the region of Tyre. It's a region, not a city. Not a city. Um, it's about 20 miles from the Sea of Galilee. So we're not, we're not here dealing with an area even on the Sea of Galilee anymore. He's going up. It's sort of north and west of the Sea of Galilee. That's the area he's heading. And I say about 20 miles. I mean 20 miles till you get to like that region. You could keep going and you'll be further into it. So it's somewhere out there. This is um, some, an area you have to pass through. You have to pass through this area of Tyre to get to a place called Caesarea Philippi. And that's where Mark chapter 8 is going to be. In Mark 8, they'll be in a place up in the north called Caesarea Philippi. If you ever take a trip to, to Israel, they will, I guarantee you, you will take a trip to Caesarea Philippi and you'll stand there and you'll look at the, where the gods are all worshipped and stuff. And it's where Peter's like, you know, Jesus says, who do you say I am? And Peter's like, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And it's this great confession moment. But we'll save that for chapter 8. They're on their way there. Here, they're in Tyre, and it says in verse 24, as I continue, And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know of it, yet he could not escape notice. Why? Why did Jesus, again, not want people to know like what he was doing or where he was? Why? Um, well, there's a few options. It could be to avoid crowds trying to start a revolution. We've already seen this as a problem in the Gospels. The crowds want to hijack Jesus and use him for their purposes because they get all excited about Jesus but they want to use it for their own purposes instead of coming in line with God's purposes. And this is a modern day issue as well. 
people get all excited about Jesus or Christianity, but then they want to hijack and use it for their own purposes. Recently, there was a Twitter war um, around Christmas time when someone tweeted out that Jesus was a refugee. And the implication of this tweet is Jesus endorses the Democratic Party. <laughs> like this, was, this was kind of the context of the tweet. And, and I had a, a, a uh, my nephew actually text me and was like, he's like, Mike, is this right? And he texted me the tweet and he's like, is that right? And I was like, well, technically, no, this is not accurate. Um, the thing is that Jesus's status, refugee or not, has zero to do with modern debates about immigration. It's just this has zero to do with it. And so we don't want to be hijacking and taking scripture and truths of Christ and trying to uh, force him to be the spokesman for our agenda, lest we just end up with a mascot with a big fake Jesus mask dancing around trying to get people to follow what we tell him to do. So that's one issue. Another issue is maybe Jesus is tired. Maybe he's trying to get rest. Okay, maybe there's a time for that. Like, you know, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here kind of thing. I'm, I'm going to take a nap. Okay, I'm going to go to sleep. That may be part of it. It may be that Jesus wanted to focus on discipling a smaller crowd, so he doesn't want the massive crowds there because oftentimes he would pull the disciples aside to teach them in more detail. And it could also be just to avoid the paralyzing nature of mobbish crowds. Sometimes the crowds would be too thick that he just can't really function well. You can't, people aren't listening, they're just shoving and arguing, and so that might be an issue as well. But here's a lesson I think we can learn in verse 24. Jesus is like, don't tell anybody I'm here. I don't want people to know that I'm around. I think the lesson is this, and it's consistent in Mark and in the Gospels. Jesus was led by his mission, not by the crowds. And this applies to those of us who are doing ministry. And we're confronted with this question all the time. You know, we inevitably think a successful ministry is the one that has a lot of people in it. And I know that we know that's not true, but we, th we think it anyway. And I mean, you know, I, I mentioned this before, but I've been, I've met pastors so many times where the first question they ask, oh, the, well, first they say, hey, what's your name? Like, okay, where are you from? Next question, oh, from Hosanna Christian Fellowship. They go, oh, how big is your church? And I would, I, from the first time I heard this question, it bothered me. I just felt like it was weird. Um, so I would always just downplay and dodge the question. I'd be like, oh yeah, not very big. <laughs> That's all I would say, because I just, I just hate that whole line of thought. It just seems irrelevant to me. I think that there are wonderful, godly preachers with tiny little churches, and there are totally compromised guys with massive churches. And there are wonderful, godly guys with massive churches. It just doesn't mean anything. The size of your church doesn't really mean a whole lot. But his mission led, not the crowds, because we're called to make disciples, not called to get a following. And that is important. We're called to make disciples, not called to get a following. And I think for those who are pastors and doing ministry and they're thinking about, should I do this or should I do that? Just remember your calling is not about getting a following, although it will get you influence, it will get you respect, and it will get you invited back. But it's not your calling. Verse 25, it goes on. After hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race, and she kept asking to cast the demon out of her daughter. That phrase kept asking, it's this continual statement. She's asking over and over and over again. She just keeps asking persistently. And that's seen in hindsight, we'll see this as a good quality of hers. And that's something Jesus kind of gives us about prayer is that we continue to ask, we continue to pursue God. You're getting tired of praying about that same thing over and over again. Yet scripture would seem to encourage you to continue. And I hope that encouragement sticks with us. She's an example of this very thing. She keeps asking. Now, Matthew, he adds some more details here. In Matthew 15, we can read about this, verse 20 through, 22 through 25, the parallel passage. It says, and a Canaanite woman, notice that she's called a Canaanite in Matthew's passage. Mark called her a Syrophoenician, who is a Gentile. Matthew says, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed, but he did not answer her a word. Jesus didn't even answer her. And his disciples came and implored him saying, send her away because she keeps shouting at us. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but she came and began to bow down before him saying, Lord, help me. So Matthew recording a uh, different perspective on the same story. He gives us a couple more details. One of those things is, again, she is persistent. She won't stop. She's kind of chasing after, you know, Lord, help, 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 help to the disciples are like, Jesus, can you send her away? She won't listen to us. You'll have to do it. And so then he actually engages in the conversation with her, which ends up resulting in her getting what she's praying for. So she got help when she comes and she yields to Christ. 
Notice who she is. This is important. Between Mark and Matthew, we get a full description. She's a Gentile from Syrophoenicia, or this is a Syrian area of Phoenicia. Syrian area of Phoenicia. Why is this interesting? Well, Matthew helps us out. He just said she's a Canaanite. Now you get the idea. She's a Canaanite. Now, do you, do you, can, you, can you get it in your head, the idea of how the Jew would respond to the Canaanite woman asking help from their Messiah? Who do you think you are? Canaanite. Get out of here. The issue isn't that she's a woman. I mean, maybe that is an issue in their culture, but Jesus seems to ignore that issue all the time. The issue is that she's a Canaanite. She's not Jewish. That's the issue. That's the issue we should actually focus on. That's what Jesus is focusing on. Well, verse 27 goes on. And he was saying to her, "Little, uh, let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. And he said to her, Because of this answer, go, the demon has gone out of your daughter. The demon has gone out of your daughter because of that answer. And going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed, the demon having left. Okay, let's, now let's, let's tackle the tough part, I think, of this passage, which is also where the, where the gems are, where the gold is. <clears throat> The problem is, not again, it's not that she's a woman. Uh, Jesus constantly elevates women's status. He allows, um, uh, I always get them confused, Mary and Martha, when there was, one of them wanted to sit at the feet of Jesus. That was Mary, Mary, Mary right? I don't know why. Any, for, it's a weird quirk of mine when, the names, when names start with the same letter that I always get them confused in my head. So Mary, Martha, Artesia, Alondra. I always get them mixed in my head. Um, anyhow, so Mary wants to sit at the feet of Jesus. Martha's busy working. She's like, Lord... Tell Mary to help me. And he says, no, Mary's chosen that better part, and I won't take it from her. Well, what she's doing is chosen the part of a disciple sitting at the feet of the teacher. And this is not something that was culturally acceptable in the Jewish mind. And so Jesus is allowing a woman to be this disciple of his. How interesting. Um, you know, in Christ, there is no male nor female. So it, it's not that the issue is particularly her being a woman. She's a Gentile. That's the issue. We must notice Jewish and Gentile issues throughout the scripture when we read the Bible because they actually play a really central role in understanding the gospel itself. If you notice these issues when you're reading the book of Romans, you have a whole new understanding of Romans. If you notice it when you're reading the gospels, you have a much fuller understanding of the gospels. Two Gentile issues. So Jesus, he seems to be saying this, that his ministry is for the Jews, the children in his parable, not the Gentiles, the dogs in his parable. So it's for the Jews, not the Gentiles, the children, not the dogs. Now, let me give you a reason why we would say Jesus' ministries for the Jews. And you're here, you're like, but wait, most of us are Gentiles. <laughs> and yet here we are experiencing Jesus' Jesus's ministry. Ah, But that's why we need to understand the phrase, the Jew first, in Scripture. It's not to the Jew only. It's to the Jew first. And that's actually what Jesus said as well. So here we are, Genesis 18, 18. God says to Abraham, um, since Abraham surely will become, or about Abraham, will become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. About Abraham, God says that Abraham will become a mighty and great nation, and all the other nations will be blessed through that nation, through him, ultimately through Christ. He's the seed that fulfills all the promises made through Abraham. In Genesis twenty-two eighteen, 18, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you've obeyed my voice. That's speaking of him offering Isaac, which is a picture of the cross, a picture of Christ. And that it'll be in that seed, in Christ, ultimately. All nations will be blessed. But it's in whose seed? Abraham's seed. The seed, the, uh, the Jewish man, Jesus, it's through him that then all nations will be blessed. But it's going to go first to the Jews. Genesis 26, 4, it says, I will multiply your descendants... God speaking to Abraham, as the stars of heaven and will give your descendants all these lands and by your descendants, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So there's like something God does for the Jewish people and it results in a blessing for the whole world to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Here's Jesus. He's in the middle of fulfilling this. And there's a woman who's a Gentile who comes up and to not upset the promise of God, he's going to highlight the fact that this is to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. This is what Romans 1.16 says. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Jew first, also to the Greek. Jesus, in Matthew 15, the parallel passage we read earlier, 
He answered her and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the household of Israel. Now we, we, we get the full story. He was sent only to them as the initial messenger of the new covenant. And then it expands and it goes out to all people. And that's why when Jesus is um, preaching and he sends out the 72 and he's like, hey, go into uh, all the towns of the Jews, but don't go to the Greeks. This is during his life, his life of, of ministry life, that three, three and a half years that happens right there. But then after his death and resurrection, he gives him a different command. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Ah, Jew first and also the Greek. He's in the Jew first mode when this woman comes up. That's the idea. That's why it's like, hey, the dogs, da, 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 that sort of thing. So there's a big misunderstanding there. We don't want to think Jew only. That, that would be wrong. We want to think Jew first. If you think Jesus comes to Jews only, well, first off, the, church, the Christian church is very confusing, <laughs> right? Because it seems to involve people of every you know, tribe, tongue, and everything, and not, not primarily Jewish people, although there are many Jews who are believers. Um, no, that would be like elitism or favoritism, but the scripture said it rules this out, this kind of elitism or favoritism, as though God's picking the Jews as the best of all people. That's certainly not the biblical understanding of it. Um, no, Isaiah 49, 6, it says, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. God considered a rescue operation just for the Jewish people too small of a thing. No, no, no. He wants to save the world. And so Christ is the savior of the world. So not elitism, not favoritism, not the Jew only, just the Jew first. That's why in verse 27 of Mark 7, Jesus says, let the little children be satisfied first. And in that little phrase, he doesn't rule her out, does he? He assigns her this title, dog, which is a title not for women, but for Gentiles in this context, right? And I'll explain why in a minute, but just know that it's, this is again, this is where I have to rescue the anachronism of reading feminism into the Bible. This is not helping you understand scripture at that point, but this is a Jew Gentile issue. Um, so he says, let the, let the children be satisfied first. Why? Because it's going to be, and, and this is important part. Why first? Why the Jew first? Why, why, why? Number one, it shows God's faithfulness to fulfill his promises. His promise was to Abraham and to his seed. God, that was God's promise. And so God's going to fulfill that promise. I mean, God said, I'm going to do it this way. So he's going to do it that way. It's kind of that simple. There's another reason, which is to show that our righteousness wasn't really the way of salvation. See, God gave the Jewish people a law, which they, as we read the Old Testament, we see they constantly failed at obeying that law. And then Jesus comes and God, God's like, I'm going to divorce you. And then Jesus comes, he enacts a new covenant by which we can be joined to God Right? As, as that divorce, you're not going to get remarried to the one you're divorced to. This is Old Testament law stuff. Sorry if I'm being a little confusing here. I'm trying to summarize a lot of stuff. But, um, but then Jesus comes, and he, through Christ, we're dead to the law that we might be married unto him. So he reestablishes a non-law-based relationship with God. So in other words, he's giving us the law. He's doing it through the Jew to show us that salvation is by grace through faith. That's the point. It's like a big, long theology lesson using Israel to teach us these things. There's a third reason why God goes to the Jew first. It puts Jesus in an Old Testament context to make sure that you don't become some kind of weird cult. This is important, is that if you want the Jewish Messiah, you've got to have the Jewish scriptures too. So that as you interpret Jesus and who is Jesus and what does Jesus mean and what has he done for me, I have to interpret him through the Old Testament. I can't just invent my own Jesus, which is what we're prone to do. So I get the scriptures, I get the, the whole study and lesson that God is teaching through Israel. I get the law, I get it fulfilled in Christ. I get salvation apart from works by grace alone. I get it all that because God did it to the Jew first and then to the Greek. Galatians, uh, Galatians 3.28 says this though, now that you're in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female for you all, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So positionally in Christ, there is no Jew or Gentile, right? But contextually in understanding Christ, in comprehending Christ, he is the Jewish Messiah. Does that make sense? Positionally in him, no Jew nor, nor, nor Gentile, but contextually understanding him, I better understand this Jewish stuff or I won't understand Jesus. That would be the whole deal there. 
So let's talk about the phrase dogs, because that's what catches people, I think, the most. Um, is, is the term dogs insulting? Nah, dog. It's a compliment, right? Jesus, somehow I got to find a way to say Jesus was complimenting this lady. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's insulting. If you think you're one of God's children, it's insulting. If you recognize you are not one of his children by default, then it's not insulting. It's just an accurate description. And that's really where we're going to learn our lesson or we're going to you know, kick against what the scripture is teaching us here. It's true that she is in that sense a dog, just as I am apart from Christ. I mean, is this insulting that once you were alienated from the life of God, that you were children of wrath? Is that insulting to people? Well, it is if they don't think it's true. But if they think, yeah, no, I am a child of wrath. That's right. I'm storing up God's wrath against me through my sin against him. If I recognize this, I'm not insulted. I'm just like, yep, that's an actual, that's a diagnosis. You know, if your doctor tells you you're, you're going to die in six months, that's insulting unless you're actually going to die in six months. If he tells you that you're smoking and your lifestyle is what's killing you, that's insulting unless you realize it's true. So the, the dog designation is insulting unless you realize it's true. And how is it true? In what sense is it true? It's true in this sense of Ephesians 2.12. It says, remember that you were at the same time separate from Christ, excluded from the, com the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And this is my state before salvation. I'm apart from God. I'm without God. I'm especially um, their Gentile setting. And now we live in a slightly different culture because we might even have a Christian background in our upbringing that makes this seem like it doesn't apply as simplistically, right? But imagine her life. This woman is part of the Gentile group who worships false gods. They have, they have turned their back upon the God of creation. They're worshiping idols. Then she comes, probably she's tried to see her daughter healed of this thing through all manner of pagan means and just failed. So she's hearing about this Jesus guy. She hears about him. She's, she's convinced he's the real, real deal. Maybe she's heard stories. Maybe she's even seen something. I don't know. And so she comes to Jesus and she's like, you can do this for me. Please do this. But her background is that she's rebelled against the very God of creation. And now she's reaching out for the one who's fulfilling the promise to the one nation God called out of all that. But she's not one of those. She's not part of that club. And so she's alienated from these things. The idea here is we want to be kept from assuming that we're right with God automatically. But this is, this is what I'll call the Bible Belt Syndrome. Is that we just think we're right with God. I've known people who could sit in 100,000 Bible studies preaching the gospel and how you, you know, you've sinned and you've fallen short and you must commit your life to Christ. And, you know, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. And they could hear all this stuff over and over again, but it doesn't like change their hearts to the awareness that, that they've never had that moment where they were broken up in their own sin and humbly came to God and said, Lord, I need you. I need your grace. I need your forgiveness. I have nothing to offer. I'm, I'm the alienated one, but I need you to adopt me. Instead, they just think, I've always been Christian. I'm a good person. This, this Bible Belt Syndrome thing. Now, this lady, she doesn't have this problem. And that's what this, this whole idea of dog is meant to communicate. You're, you're not one of the children. You're something further away, something that doesn't exactly belong to the household of God. That's the idea. Now, Jesus would also have a similar statement to the children. He would be like, you, you're the rebellious children. You're the ones who have abandoned God and you've turned away from God. All Jew and Gentile need to turn in faith and trust in Christ to be saved, not their own works. But Jesus gives us hope. So I don't want to make it too harsh. In Jesus' statement, he, calls, he, he says dog, but there's two different words for dog in the Greek. And he uses one, not the other. Okay, there's two different words. One that we get a lot in the Old Testament. It's kuon. And we get it in the Old and the New Testament. I'll give you some examples. But this word, it refers to a dog as gross, wild. Um, it doesn't belong. It's something that's symbolically immoral. And that's the way that this word is used. I'll give you, here's some examples. Proverbs 26, 11. Like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. Okay, like a dog return. Now, this is, ugh. It's like, you know, that, you don't want to be that kind of dog, right? Revelation twenty two fifteen. Outside are the dogs, kuon. Outside are the dogs. Okay, so they don't belong. 
they're sort of um, carnal is the idea. Philippians 3.2, we're warned about false teachers. Look out for the dogs, the kuon. Matthew 7.6, do not give what is holy to dogs, kuon, right? Um, and do not throw your pearls before swine. Okay, so th- this is one use of the word, but Jesus doesn't use that word when he talks to this lady. He uses a different word. He uses the word kunarion. Here and in Matthew 15, 26, the other parallel passage where Jesus is talking to the same lady, Matthew and Mark both made sure to use this Greek word, not kuon, this other Greek word, kunarion. And it refers to a pet. It's a different kind of dog, isn't it? Yeah, not the word you would expect Jesus to use, actually. A pet. By nature, not a child, but still something you care for. Something that's it's not the child, but I mean, you have a pet dog, perhaps? Cat, which is just as good, by the way. <laughs> just different, not as good at everything. But, but you know, your, your pets are different. You know, now the children and the, the dogs, if you have to feed one, not the other, you know which one it's going to be. I, I hope. I hope you know which one it's going to be. It's going to be the child. I hope that's the case. Um, as much as you might joke about feeding the animals and starving your children. Yes, but that's the word that's used here in these two passages. Um, so Jesus' response to her, it leaves this like open door. He doesn't say, you're the kuon and you get nothing. Instead, he says, I want to feed the children first before feeding the, the, the dog that was like the more endearing word, the pets. So we're showing a difference, but we're seeing that while God, while man's alienated from God, yet God has this incredible love for us and this care for us and a provision that's planned for us. We just need to know our place and not think that God owes us salvation. You should, you need to give me heaven, God. Why? Because I'm me. I mean, look at me. I'm amazing. Uh, I'm a nice person. I'm good. I'm, I'm kind. I don't care what they say about me. Um, and that, that's the thing that we want to avoid is that kind of dangerous pride. So Jesus, his response to her, he's not reluctant at all. He's not reluctant at all. It says, then Jesus said to her in verse, uh, this is Matthew 15, 28. "Uh, Oh woman, your faith is great. Your faith is great. Like look at at this wonderful faith. He he says this, it usually ends up being of non-Jews, it seems, more often than not. Your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. Jesus' response to this woman isn't reluctant. Oh gosh, I guess I'll take care of you. You tricked me with your little... Even the dogs get the crumbs off the table thing. Okay, busted. I guess I'll help you out. He's actually celebratory about it. Oh, your faith is great. Your daughter's healed. Boom. Just like that. She gets it. The bottom line is that God wanted this whole thing to take place. Not just her showing up. Not just the issue about dog, you know, children. But the healing. He wanted that to take place too. Because this whole thing is meant to be a picture. To teach us some important lessons about how we can come to God for salvation the same way she did. That's, that's the bottom line. It's about the woman's humility. So let me point out her humility so we can see it's in the text to teach us to come to God the same way. She shows up. Okay, the fact that she shows up is an ounce of humility already, maybe more than an ounce, because she left her gods and her, she sort of turned her back on the false religion she was raised on just to show up and talk to Jesus in the first place. She goes to him and she cries out to him. This Jewish man who her people would have had a lot of prejudice against. Yet she humbles herself. She falls at his feet, the scripture says. She fell at his feet. So the idea here is that she gives him honor. She exalts him above herself. Above herself. She doesn't come to God like, you know, God, I guess if you approve yourself to me and I'll think about following you. Maybe if I approve of you. And I'm like, that person is never going to get saved because God's far from the, from the proud, but he is near the humble. So she falls at his feet, gives him honor. She knows her place, not as a woman here, but as a Gentile, um, a Gentile who had turned from God, turned from God. Romans kind of reinforces this where it talks about a relationship with God is that we're grafted in. We're not natural branches. The Gentiles, we're not natural branches. We're grafted in. That's Romans 11, verse 17 and 18. It says the following. But if some of the branches, that's the Jews, were broken off, some, not all, some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree, don't be arrogant toward the branches, but if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. See, we've, we always realize that we're brought into something uh, by God's grace. I'm brought in, uh, not by right, 
by grace. And that's the point. I think that's the main point. This woman, she takes grace as an undeserved thing. I don't deserve it. Mercy is not something you have to have on me or even are supposed to have on me. I'm just saying, help God, help me. I just need your mercy. Just please help me. Have care for me. You know, um, so she comes to God with needs, not rights. That's huge. We live in a very arrogant culture. We're arrogant without even thinking about it. And a lot of people, when I, when I engage with skeptics with questions about Christianity, there is a flavor of arrogance. I usually don't point it out because that doesn't generally help build bridges with people. <laughs> maybe I should. I don't know. Um, but there's this flavor, this sense of arrogance of like, well, you know, maybe if God, if I approve of God, maybe. So, Mike, your job is to make me approve of God. And it's, I'm kind of like, you're getting this whole thing backwards, man. Jesus is saying that God will approve you. He will fix you. He will heal you. He'll forgive you and receive you. And that should be the marvel of marvels. But when we come proud, we're going we're gonna to miss the boat. There are some potential political ramifications of this um, that I'll mention just because I think I noticed it in the text. My real concern, though, is that, this, that the political weirdness that we have in our culture doesn't enter our theology. That's my concern. I don't want politics to bleed into theology. I'm not so much worried about theology bleeding into politics. That's probably healthy as our, as our Christian worldview affects the way we consider politics. But when you, um, when you encounter more and more and more political stuff that encourages people to assume that they're entitled to things, they, they don't just have rights like human rights, but rights like rights to Uber rights, rights to special treatment from, from people because of their status and this and that. They go above and beyond other people's rights. They have this sense of entitlement. That, that that's sort of the opposite of what this woman has. And Jesus commends her for coming, not feeling entitled, but just feeling that she's needy and she's appealing to the love of God. That's it. I'm needy and I just need God's love. That's healthy. But to come with the sense of entitlement is unhealthy. I think that would um, affect our politics a bit. Now, she's a model for us here. James 4, 6 puts it this way. But he gives greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. If you have been, maybe you've been searching for God and you've decided against what seems to be all your better judgment to listen to this message all the way this far still. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to say like a really honest question for you to ask yourself is, is my pride affecting my ability to find God? Is that possible? Is it possible that my, my pride, which I may find in a source of um, be thinking I'm smarter than I am, thinking I'm more good than I am, and thinking that I that I'm sort of owed. God just owes me. I have a list of things God owes me that he's not, I don't think he's given me. That will keep you from God because God opposes the proud. There's a spiritual issue that's going on there. But if you come humbly, you come humbly, he's going to draw near to you. So this is against the people who stand in judgment over God. It's the exact opposite of what I see in online, especially online atheist communities, um, people who stand in judgment over God. Well, if, if God's real, then he's got some questions I want him to answer. And I'm like, you haven't really thought this through, have you? <laughs> like, like, whatever your view of reality is, if it includes God being real and you on earth shaking your fist at him, something's gone wrong. <laughs> like, there's something terribly unwise about this whole posture. If, 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 if I'm an atheist and I think if God's real, I should... I should be worried, not angry. I should be concerned. There's something I'm missing. There's some area where I'm so missing the boat that I'm in grave danger. And gosh, the majority of the world does see that God exists. What is going on in me that I don't? I mean, there's something else going on here. Psalm 138 verse 6 says, For, the Lord, for though the Lord is exalted, yet he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. The haughty he knows from afar. People who are proud, yeah, you're going to be like, I can't find God. Why can't I find God? And that may be a result of pride. So God rejects that attitude. Um, the, re the recommendation is fall at his feet just like this woman did. Come to God humbly. Come to God with no sense of I deserve, I deserve, but just a sense of I need, I need. But you care enough about me, even though I don't deserve it. You care enough about me. My salvation is almost like the crumbs that fall off the table from you because your resources are so grand. In the overall context of Mark, 
this is the beginning of Jesus's ministry to the Gentiles. He does have a ministry to the Gentiles. He went first to the Jews, the Galilee area, but he does do a lot of stuff in the Gentile area. We don't know all the stuff he does because we have a, you know, years of his life shortened down into the gospels. Um, but he's going to feed the 4,000. It seems that the feeding of the 4,000 we're about to read about is largely a Gentile audience. Not exclusively, but it seems like it was largely Gentile, which is the, the first feeding of the 5,000 was probably all Jewish or almost all Jewish. Um, now, I want to talk about a cool connection in this passage, a connection with Elijah. Um, in Elijah's life, he did a certain number of miracles, right? One of the miracles Jesus highlights that Elijah does, Jesus actually talks about it, is when Elijah helps this woman. He raises this woman's dead child. Also, he helps her out with food during a drought. You know, when that, those years when Elijah was praying, there was no rain. Um, so it's in 1 Kings 17. I'm not going to read the whole passage, but it's, it's long. Uh, 1 Kings 17, verses 8 through 24. That's the whole section. There are some parallels, though, with Elijah raising this woman's child and Jesus helping this other woman's child. Um, first off, it's a Gentile woman. It's a Gentile woman, and Jesus highlights this, and he highlights it when he's in Nazareth. He highlights it, we already talked about this, but he highlights it to say, hey, remember how um, you know, Elijah helps this, the, the Gentile woman, or Elisha helps the Gentile Naaman with his leprosy. There was lots of lepers in Israel. There was, he's saying, look, there was, a, there was people of God, men of God, who had access, the, Israel had access to them. They ignored them. They didn't receive the blessings because of their unbelief, and even Gentiles came and believed and received. Jesus is predicting sort of the flow of the Jew first and the Gentile that's going to happen in the New Testament. So it was a Gentile woman, from, and it was from the same region. The woman's from the same area when Elijah went up and helped her. Both of them have a child who is saved by this messenger of God. In 1 Kings 17, verse 24, the woman, she converts to the God of Israel as a result of this. It says, Then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Let me give it to you with a little bit of Hebrew in there. Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of Yahweh in your mouth is truth. She's a Gentile woman, but she knows that Yahweh is true. So she converts as a result of this miracle that is done. And the Syrophoenician woman, it seems as though she also converted. Uh, Jesus says, that she has great faith, great faith. So there's like a conversion that's gone on there. What's interesting is that Elijah failed to con convert many of his own people. Jesus failed to convert many of his own people, not through his own failure of any kind, but through the people's failures. And so many Gentiles actually received. And so there's just a parallel that's there that I think is very interesting. It ultimately foreshadows God's love and provision for the non-Jew or for the one who's alienated from God. You're alienated from God. You know you don't deserve it. You feel like, why should I even bother? If I went to a church, the room would fall down upon my head because of my wickedness. Uh, God couldn't hear my prayers. He's not interested in my prayers. You don't even know what I've done. I won't even tell you what I've done. I'm that bad. I'll be like, you're ready. You're ready for grace, right? Because you're not coming entitled. You're coming just, okay, sure, I'm a dog, Lord. Forgive me, help me, save me. And God receives you. And that's what this is about. The whole thing was planned out from the beginning. From the beginning. Don't be offended. Learn from it. Learn of the humility that God wants us to come to him with. Just like Abraham and Isaac. Some people are bothered by Abraham and Isaac because Abraham went to offer his son. to God says, kill your son. Yet the whole plan was there from the beginning that he would never do it. It would just paint a picture that represented God offering his son for our salvation. So if you stop being offended long enough to see the whole picture, you'll see what God's teaching us through these things. So she shows us what saving faith looks like. Humble, desperate, even clingy to God. Even clingy. Where you're just down on your knees. Lord, help me, help me, help me, save me. And, it's, and I do think this overflows into our prayer life. That maybe there's needs you have that you're praying over and you feel like, should I even keep praying over this? Um, I think a good default answer is to go ahead and continue to pray. I do encourage you, though, even if you're praying for something that um, feels like you haven't got the yes answer yet, don't quit praying. But you could, you could unnecessarily burden yourself by thinking that God has to say yes or that he hasn't heard you. I don't know what God's will is in every situation. And I think it's really healthy for us as Christians to be comfortable by saying, Lord, I need this, I pray for this, but I trust you no matter what. 
I mean, that's a healthy, healthy place to be. You continue to pray, but from a place of trust in God's character. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this, this, uh, this word, this woman. It's neat to think. I, I wish we knew about her life, Lord. Um, what happened years ago before she came to Jesus, how she heard about him, what her journey was like, uh, what it was like when she got home and saw her child healed. It's, just, it's neat, Lord. Uh, may we learn from it, though. May we learn the humility and the faith that we're supposed to have, that there were those who were traveling with Jesus, but who just didn't have the simple trust in Christ that he, um, he was the one who could help. They were curious. They were interested. They were following, but they weren't, maybe weren't believing, weren't trusting him. So may we learn that lesson. May we learn the lesson of humility, of to come, with, come to you, Lord, with, um, with no, no deserves, only needs, only needs. And Lord, you meet our needs. You care for us. We thank you so much for your grace and your forgiveness and for your provision for those of us who have done nothing to earn it. In Jesus' name, amen.